Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to the third day of this um, summer school on climate change and macroeconomics, particularly from a few points central bankers might be interested in. Um, I just want to remind you of our housekeeping uh, rules, that is, uh, please switch off uh, your microphone and your uh, video if, if possible, and put only your questions in the chat, uh, and, and then we would uh, voice it uh, later on at a bit point when we think it's, it's appropriate. So, Let me just introduce to our speaker of today, and uh, as, we, as you might have already heard, the, the quality of our uh, uh, transmission is much better than it was yesterday. Sorry for that again. Uh, Professor Warwick McKibben uh, is the Vice Chancellor Chair in Public Policy at Crawford School in Public Policy of the Australian National University. Um, he has also worked for the Brookings Institute, and from there, by the way, we got uh, an, 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 a very important paper uh, written in 2017, exactly on the issue he's talking about today, climate change and monetary policy regimes. Uh, which, and, and only the, the last word, as you see, is a bit different from, from what we've heard so far during this, uh, uh, during this course, and uh, you will explain what, what, what exactly this will mean for us. So Professor McGibbon, I mean, has an outstanding career. He's not only dealing with climate change issues, but with a lot of other issues, many of them uh, uh, having a kind of global component, so it's uh, in a true sense an international econo economist and uh, providing, for example, uh, models and, 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 um, and uh, research, for example, to the uh, WHO on uh, pandemic issues. He already worked on this uh, quite uh, before the the, the, the current crisis, and uh, is I mean I, I, you got the, the his, his bio and you will see there all the, the, the all these many activities he has so far so far um, undertaken, and with I, I just leave it here and uh, just want to say that we are very thankful that you're. Join us here, and we are very interested now to hear your speech. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Andreas, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, this is a very important topic, and it's great to see um, the Austrian Central Bank um, running a, a, summer, a summer course on this issue. Um, I should mention uh, as well as uh, I spent 10 years on, as a board member of the Australian Central Bank from 2001 to 2011 um, during the crisis. And actually the modeling, which I'll touch upon in this presentation as well, was in instrumental in our design of our policy responses. Um, okay, um, okay, so let me just talk about I'll, the, the structure of the presentation. Um, I'll talk about the basics of climate um, policy. Um, I'll talk a little bit at length about a hybrid approach, which uh, is essentially climate policy designed by a central bank. How would you do it if, um, if you asked a central banker to do it? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the model that I'll be using for some illustrating, illustrating some results. Um, we, this well-documented model, I won't go into much detail. And I'll give you some illustrations of some of the interactions we learned from the climate issues using that model. I'll then touch on monetary policy basics, which um, everyone in the room probably understand, but I think it's good to couch some of the issues in the context of climate change. Then talk about how the two issues interact with each other, and then I'll show some results um, just to illustrate that the monetary regime does matter for the way the climate policy regime is implemented 
and how it impacts on the economy. Now, um, this draws on an a updated version of the paper that Andreas mentioned, which is coming out in the next week or so in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. Um, it's climate change and monetary policies. In that, this paper, we look at what, how do you design policy, but actually what sort of model would be useful for a central bank to use to understand this better. So the key point I want to stress on climate change is it's both the impact of climate change itself, as well as the way you design climate change policy that matter for monetary policy. So there's two distinct sets of issues coming out of the climate change that are relevant for central banks. And what's important is that the shocks we get from the climate, um, they have both aggregate effects and they have sector specific effects and they affect quantities and they affect prices. They affect relative prices, they reflect inflation. This is a key, this is a key issue. The different, um, this is the second issue is that the different climate policies that people have advocated have in differential effects on inflation and output. They change price trends, they have impacts on price volatility, they change potential output estimation and they have different aggregate demand effects. So from a central banker's point of view, the design of the climate policy is very important for the way in which monetary policy would be implemented. So um, I will stress here that um, I work separately on climate policy, policy and separately on monetary policy. When you separate them and you talk about what's the best regime for a country, you tend to get a fairly clear outcome in both cases. But when you join them together, it turns out my views particularly changed that maybe the best thing from a purely monetary point of view is not optimal policy when you're dealing with an integrated climate monetary world. Uh, and so that I think we have to rethink the way we do monetary policy and rethink the way we design climate policy, taking into account monetary implications. Andreas, is that all coming through clearly? Yes, so far very fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So some basics on the climate. Um, the shocks that we're seeing coming from the climate itself, um, um, coming from disruption, climatic disruption, ocean acidification, we have storm surges, we have cities being damaged, we have flooding, we have um, vulnerability to droughts and floods. We've got disruption in production through resource supply. Um, in Australia, the wildfires that we had uh, earlier this year was very disruptive for the supply side of the economy. And we have disruption to labour supply. So um, the, pretty much most of the shocks we're getting is a combination of demand and supply shocks, but the supply shocks are particularly serious. And when you dig down into sectors themselves, you have very different impacts of the climate, whether it's on agriculture, whether it's on aquaculture, whether it's on tourism, whether it's on um, a whole range of different sectors of the economy you're getting potentially very, very different sectoral shocks coming from climate change. Now, on the policy side, um, climate policy is also has an impact on the economy. And the way to think about climate policy is, is it's largely a supply shock. And at least the impact really does depend on the design of the policy itself. For example, it's important how stringent is the policy. How, how quickly a government's going to be adjusting their, their policies to achieve a particular outcome for the climate. Um, what's the timing? What policies themselves will be used, whether it's cap and trade, carbon pricing or carbon taxes versus a hybrid? I'll elaborate to be clear on what those policies are and why they're different from monetary policy. It also matters on what you do with the revenue, because some of these policies do generate a substantial amount of revenue and the use of revenue in the research we've done and other people have done matters a great deal for the impact of these policies on the climate, but also on uh, the macroeconomic outcomes. And one of the key issues is the different types of gas, different types of uh, fossil fuels have very different uh, emissions. So we've got coal has much higher carbon content than gasoline or natural gas. And um, another issue of climate policy is the impact on individual sectors of climate policy vary by sector, by region and by fuel. And it comes down largely to what's the carbon intensity of different activities and what's the elasticity of substitution of different activities in, in the economy. So let's just be clear on the types of climate policies that um, people advocate. Um, one is a permit trading system. The way this works is that you have a target for emissions. They have a fixed target. You create a market for trading um, the rights 
to emit that are associated with the target. You have an allocation and then people buy and sell the carbon, price, the carbon rights and you generate a carbon price. So the key feature of a permit trading system is that the quantity of emissions is fixed and the price of emissions is highly variable. The alternative approach is instead of picking the target, is to pick a carbon tax rate. That is, tax the emissions of carbon, usually at the very high end of the generation chain, tax coal, tax oil, tax gas. Um, when you have a carbon tax, you have a fixed price for carbon, and that price of carbon will feed into the production processes of the entire economy, and the emissions will change depending on how that price impacts on the individual decisions of households and firms, particularly firms. And so the emissions themselves come from the market. So if you think of it and compare, compared to a permit trading system, in this case, the price is fixed and the emission quantity varies. So the two types of approaches in a deterministic world will be identical, if you, but in a stochastic world, they're very different. So they're two discrete approaches. A third approach, which is getting a lot of traction um, in various countries and has appeared in various ways and actually has been discussed in you know, Germany just recently, um, is what we call a hybrid. And it's a hybrid of long-term emissions trading combined with a short-term carbon tax. And so this is the idea that you set the short-term price of carbon like a carbon tax does, but you actually set the long-term quantity of emissions. And, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the alternative to all of these policies, of course, is direct regulation. And direct regulation is generally very expensive, very inefficient. So most of the economic analysis suggests that you want to use one of these types of approaches. Now the hybrid, I'll spend just one slide or two slides talking about that because actually I think from a central bank's point of view, this is, actually, this is something which would be well understood. This was originally published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives 18 years ago, um, but because climate change 18 years ago was not really taken that seriously in the economics profession, I would argue, uh, this policy Go, uh, regurgitate is regurgitated every now and then, but the basic essence is in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. So how does it work? Well, if you combine the best features of emissions trading with carbon pricing. And so the idea here is because climate change is a long-term issue of concentrations, how much carbon is in the atmosphere, um, uh, you want to eventually achieve a particular level of emissions in the economy. In the economy. And so ideally, uh, if you follow the, the, the scientific recommendations, is to get to z net zero emissions by 2050. That's to avoid even further temperature increases that are already locked in uh, for the present. And so the idea is you, you have a concentration target and you have a path of emissions from today to 2050 to achieve this. The government in each country would set an emissions goal and then you create the equivalent of a central bank of carbon. And the role of the carbon bank is to record emissions of large polluters. So you need to know how much emissions there are in the economy. You create the right to emit and you create a financial instrument, an emission certificate, exactly equal to the amount of emissions in your target. And then you require all large emitters to hold annual certificates. We call them assets because it's, a, it's an asset that's offset against the liability of their emissions. So, um, you then take these emission certificates. So in any year in the future, an emitter, if they wish to emit, has to purchase or have to have in their portfolio one of these emission certificates. We then take these emission certificates and we bundle them into a carbon bond. So in other words, a carbon bond is like a 30-year um, government bond where instead of a coupon of payment of interest, you get a coupon, which is your right to emit a certain amount of emissions each year or in that particular year. And then we introduce the central bank's role of capping the short-term price. So in other words, as central banks are setting the interest rate in most economies, they're fixing the price in the short term, the long-term bond market is setting the price of bonds in the longer term. We're going to have the central bank of carbon set the short-term carbon price by issuing as many certificates in this year that's required to hold the price, and the market then um, will determine the long-term uh, carbon price. So we want to eliminate volatility because volatility in short-term energy prices is bad for the economy. But we also want to give a guarantee to people making short-term energy decisions, uh, short-term contracts, that the price of carbon is, is known. That's the advantage of a carbon tax. So how does this work? Well, you've got these long-term bonds. The government allocates them all at the beginning. So you're tying the hands of future governments, which is an attractive uh, proposition from 
um, rock or barrow. Um, you then create markets. You create markets to have trade the annual certificates. You create markets to trade the carbon bonds, which are like long-term bonds. And you have, therefore will generate a series of future markets. So you'll have markets trading the certificates for each point in the future out to 2050. What you effectively create is a yield curve for carbon prices. So what's important is that future carbon prices is what drives investment. And you want that to be regulated by a central bank of carbon. So we have this idea of generating a long-term carbon price to drive innovation and a short-term fixed carbon price to prevent economic volatility. Um, and now this is very important from a central bank's point of view. So what we're doing here is creating long-term price signals because we want people to change their behaviour and we want for firms and individuals to make long-term investments that reduce their dependence on carbon. Um, we're getting uh, markets creating signals so that as new information comes about the climate or new information on the science, um, we price this immediately into markets. So we don't have to wait for governments to, to make decisions. The markets will tell the um, air generators and the emitters uh, what will be happening in future years. And very importantly, this creates a political constituency. Once these property rights are allocated throughout the economy, including to fossil fuel intensive industries, they will be balancing off the change in value of their carbon physical assets against the, uh, their carbon um, bonds. And it also is a way of increasing the wealth of individuals in the short term by allocating carbon bonds to uh, consumers is that uh, that's the present value of future emissions out to 2050, which can be very valuable to offset the increase in the cost of uh, electricity and petroleum, et cetera. So that's a summary of the, of the hybrid. Um, we can talk about that later if people are interested. Um, but I, you know, I'm a strong supporter of that, of that approach. Now, one of the things that's very different, and this is important for central banks, is that the different three different policies for carbon pricing have very different impacts for volatility. So a carbon tax will have a fixed carbon price, a carbon trading system will have a variable carbon price, and a hybrid will have a short-term fixed price, but a long-term variable price. Now, if you look at the recent experience of the European uh, EU emissions trading system, this is the price of, 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 um, of allowances in the EU system between 2005 and 2018. You can see enormous volatility. This enormous volatility in carbon allowances would imply volatility in, in, in energy prices, which imply some sort of volatility going into the overall inflation rate of the economies in Europe. So a uh, carbon tax would not lead to this sort of price volatility. This is important for central banking. Now let me just, um, Andreas, is everything going smoothly? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now I just want to introduce the GQ model just because um, I will be using some examples throughout the rest of this lecture. And, um, and I, I think it's important that you know this model exists. Um, because some central banks think that we don't have the tools to analyse carbon policy for central banks, when in fact we have a number of tools. One of them includes the GQ model. This is a model that um, was published um, originally in 1999 uh, in economic modelling, but has a whole chapter in the handbook of CG modelling um, in 2013. It was developed with a large grant from the National Science Foundation and the Environmental Protection Agency in the US back in 1991. Um, so it's been around for quite a long time. Um, there are different versions of the model. It differs by country coverage and sectoral coverage. Um, we have a model of Austria that we've used for some um, policy coordination issues. Um, but in the version that I'm using in this presentation, uh, Austria has been aggregated into Europe. Um, it's, this is widely published in the climate energy journals and it's used for policy analysis and scenario planning. Uh, by the IMF, the World Bank, central banks in various countries, um, corporations in particular use it for scenario planning and a number of academic researchers. The way to think of this model, it's a hybrid of a DSGE model and a CGE model. And that is we've got a lot of inter-industry linkages. We capture trade, capital flows, intertemporal consumption and investment decisions. Because of its scale and it is a large model, um, it's an annual macroeconomic model with sectoral dynamics. And there are various frictions in the model that matter for climate and monetary issues, uh, frictions in the labour market and in capital accumulation. So in the long run, we have full employment, but in the short run, we have wage stickiness, which causes, uh, which leads to short-term unemployment. We have labour mobility across sectors, but not across regions. 
fairly conventional um, model. Um, we have a capital labour energy material, CLEM production function. Firms are maximising their share market value subject to adjustment costs in physical capital accumulation. Households maximise expected utility subject to wealth and liquidity constraints. We have a mix of forward looking and backward looking um, be behaviour. The forward looking individuals are assumed to be rational and used to model for their long term projection. But we do have this capacity for short term unemployment. We have full vector, a full set of financial markets for bonds, equity, foreign exchange. And we track the flow of goods, services, and financial assets in the global economy. Very importantly, uh, each country has a fiscal rule for government spending and tax policy. And each country follows a monetary rule, which shows how interest rates will adjust to the various trade offs in the policy targets. So the key features are intertemporal optimization by households and firms, forward looking savings and investment decisions, financial arbitrage, which makes this very different to a conventional CGE type model, which usually doesn't have money. Um, but there also there's a lot of rule of thumbs to try and track the actual data. Um, there's a lot of econometric parameterization uh, in the elasticities of substitution in production and consumption at the sectoral level. And we have a very detailed model of uh, technical catch up, which I won't go into now. A key point of this model is it differentiates between financial and physical capital. Financial capital can move across the economy and across countries very quickly. Whereas physical capital is putty clay. Once an investment decision is made, the capital is nailed down in that particular sector. So in the version that I'll be using in the rest of some of the illustrations, this version has 10 regions and countries. So the entire world is broken up into half advanced economies and half emerging countries. The reason for worrying about emerging countries is future emissions are mainly coming from China and India and the rest of the world. Whereas the historical emissions have all come from the advanced economies. And um, we have a lot of sectoral detail, so I won't go through everything, but um, we have 20 sectors in the economy. Uh, we have the economy divided up into uh, primary energy type sectors, um, and then production sectors like mining, agriculture. And then we have a lot of detail in energy generation. To understand the issue of climate change and macro, you need to actually have sufficient movements in relative prices at this degree of disaggregation to pick up some of the key macroeconomic implications of both shocks and policies. We have a lot of detail in the electricity sector. So that's that's the model. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but um, you think of it as a DSG model with lots and lots of disaggregation. Um, so how does the carbon tax affect the economy? I'm going to use an example from this model just to illustrate this. Um, this is from a paper um, with my co-authors, Morris Wilcoxon and Larry Liu in climate change economics. And we just asked the question, um, what if there's a CO2 tax starting at $25 a tonne. Um, most policies to deal with targeting an amount of emissions that's relevant for um, stabilising temperatures has a fairly high carbon price at the beginning and therefore, um, and also a carbon price that tends to rise over time. The reason it rises over time is you think of this as a resource depletion problem. And so the hoteling rule is, is a solution. There's a fixed amount of carbon in the, in the atmosphere and you're going to extract it at the real rate of interest or at some real rate of interest. We're assuming here 5%. Um, 5% seems quite high in today. today. Um, I just want to show you what happens to output in each sector and to the overall macro economy if you do this in the US. And we, we have four different assumptions. Now the border tax adjustment assumption is not relevant for today, but um, they're in the results. So we do this carbon tax. And then we have two ways in which we use the revenue. One is a lump sum rebate to households, and the other is to uh, reduce the tax rate on capital. This is to demonstrate how important the assumptions about the revenue are independently of the change in the carbon price. And then we have border tax adjustments. So suppose you don't have any border tax adjustments versus a case where you adjust uh, any countries whose um, carbon content is coming into your economy, you adjust that uh, at the border. Now, what this chart shows you is that the, um, this is the carbon tax. So we run the model, the world of the future with no carbon tax. We then change the carbon tax in a surprise in the first year, and then the model adjusts. So what I'm showing you here are the differences between the baseline and what happens as a result of the policy. Now, there are four different bars for each sector. So this is electric utilities. This is coal extraction. This is gas extraction. Um, the green is the lump sum rebate, the KT is the capital tax change, and then there's various border tax adjustments which I won't focus on. 
The first point to notice here is that the biggest impact, this is just for the US, the biggest impact is on coal extraction. A carbon tax is a tax on coal. It's also a tax on gas because gas does have carbon content and it's also a tax on oil. Now, this is, these sectors are the ones that have the biggest output of the impacts and the biggest employment impact. But notice that the processing industries also get impacts. So gas utilities and petroleum and refining, because these primary energy inputs go into these sectors and they're used to generate outputs that filters through the economy, through electricity, and then through the rest of the economy, although to a lesser extent on mining, et cetera. Although there is a positive impact on services. So this, this shows you firstly, very big differential across sectors. Oh, and I should mention, I don't have the graph here, but also a very big difference in the prices of each of these goods. So the relative price shock from a carbon tax is very different across different parts of the economy. What happens to the aggregate economy? Well, here's a fairly standard result. Again, this is percent deviation from what otherwise would be the case. You put in the carbon tax, um, this is shows you the, uh, the GDP under the four scenarios. Let's focus on the lump sum rebate. You increase carbon tax, you increase the price of energy, you increase the price of inputs in the economy, it causes GDP to fall. The GDP falls by, 20, by five years into the policy, roughly 1% of GDP. It's not the growth rate, this is the level of GDP relative to what it would be. You can see that the growth rate is the slope of this line and the growth rate gradually goes back to where it was, but at each point in the future, GDP is lower. And again, the lump sum rebate, very conventional. Now suppose instead of rebating this to households, we actually use it to cut the corporate tax rate. This is what the um, um, this is what the dotted line is. Now the dotted line is so what you're doing now is you're actually stimulating investment. You're reducing the tax on, on capital, therefore you stimulate investment, therefore you can offset quite significantly um, some of the negative GDP effects. If you do a border tax adjustment, it actually leads to an even more positive effect because you're uh, changing the prices of inputs at the, uh, at the border uh, and that leads to a very different outcome. So different recycling assumptions have very big impacts at the macro level on the impacts of a carbon tax. What about the timing of a carbon tax? This is a different paper. This is a paper where we say, suppose we have a carbon tax which is optimal in the sense of stabilising uh, emissions in the US. In period one, it jumps. In this case, it was jumping to $15 per tonne, and it rises at a particular rate. So this is a, this is a standard uh, targeting of some emission level in the US economy. What if we now delay by two presidential terms? And when we wrote this, um, we wrote this in case President Trump won the election in the US and tried to kill climate policy. So we said, suppose we do get a president that's going to not have any climate policy, and we delay for eight years. Well, if you delay for eight years and you want to hit the same target, you either have to have a higher tax or a tax that rises more quickly. So delaying policy, because we're looking at a concentration target, can lead to very different price profiles, uh, very different carbon tax profiles and very different price profiles and very different output effects uh, in the future. So that, that's... Uh, talking about climate, uh, carbon tax as a particular policy. The other policies are much harder for central banks to deal with because non-price climate policies, regulation at the state level, to give you an example how complicated it is, this is a map of the US where the implicit price of carbon is, 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 is shown in each of these various regions. It varies across the, the country quite dramatically. Um, this makes it very difficult for central banks to know what the impacts of a climate policy would be in the inflation rate, for example, and also makes it very difficult to predict. So that's, that's Climate 101, um, just to give you an idea of, um, of some of the issues that come out for central banks. Let me now map, map, give you a quick overview of Monetary Policy 101. So as you know, central banks usually have a, some target of either price stability or some uh, goal for economic activity. There's a big debate about which should you use rules versus discretion. But we do know that the best rule really does depend on the nature of the shock that comes out of decades and decades of, of, of theoretical and empirical work. The question is what rule is optimal in a carbon constrained climate disrupt, disruptive world? So um, again, with targeting rules, we have simple feedback rules um, on certain conditions back to interest rates. 
Um, we know that monetary shocks handle demand, monetary rules, whether it's an inflation rule or a normal income rule. They target, the, um, they handle demand shocks very well. However, when it comes to supply shocks, you get a lot more complicated trade-offs, particularly related to the output and inflation stability goals. And I will argue, and it's become very clear throughout this whole presentation, that climate change and climate shocks imply a world of greater supply shocks. So that makes it harder for central banks because we're expecting a lot more supply shocks. So the success of inflation targeting, for example, over the last 20 or 30 years, may be the result of it being in a world of demand shocks. Does it still hold when we get to a world of supply shocks? I'll go through this quickly because of time and because everybody probably knows what I'm going to say. Um, but what targets might we have for monetary rules? We can have an inflation target or a price level target or a nominal income, nominal growth target, or we can have a sort of Henderson, McKibben, Taylor multi-factor rule. Um, each of these different approaches use different information and each is rely, re relying on forecasts. Uh, and that's a critical issue once we consider climate change. So how do these targeting options compare, these four simple theoretical approaches, how do they compare in a world of carbon constraints? And the key point I want you to take away is that um, when you have climate change and when you have climate policies in place, the output gap is likely to become much more uncertain, much more difficult to measure, and much more difficult to forecast. This insight, and it's in the data in the US in particular, the forecastability of the output gap has, has deteriorated, it may or may not be due to climate change up until now, but this is critical. This will undermine the monetary framework if this forecastability changes dramatically. Um, now, inflation targeting, this to be um, simplifying, the, think of the interest rate as the instrument, the actual inflation rate is pi t. Bank, the central bank is targeting pi bar. So we have a simple rule, which is the interest rate is equal to previous period interest rates, plus some feedback rule on the inflation relative to target. Flexible inflation targeting, same principle, but you allow for some other discretion in not hitting the target exactly. So alpha is not very large, and there may be some other terms. In, in practice, those central banks are using forecasts of inflation. So the targeting rule is usually written with an expectation today of inflation in T plus one. And so it's critical for forecasting inflation uh, it, to have a forecast of inflation for a standard inflation forecasting central bank. This just shows you an example of what can go wrong if energy prices are moving around a lot. And this is a contribution to CPI, uh, to, to um, inflation in the UK over the period from 2009 to 2017. The movement in energy prices is quite substantial. This is one reason why central banks actually analyze or, or make projections based on core inflation and they take energy prices out. But that's okay if energy prices are being taken out because they're volatile. But it's more complicated if you take energy prices out because there's a trend in the energy price. So um, the output gap here is critical. The output gap is in the inflation forecast. And so think of the, the inflation forecast as being the target of the central bank plus your forecast or your um, actual output minus the uh, central bank's assessment of our potential output. These are both highly uncertain. And if you get the output gap wrong, then you'll get the inflation forecast wrong. And that'll make it much harder from a credibility point of view. Now we also have the um, an alternative policy instead of inflation targeting is price level targeting. And there has been quite a push from people like Ben Bernanke and others uh, to, to actually move to a price level targeting, particularly when you're at the zero lower bound. So think of the way you write the policy rule for the price level targeting central bank. You set the interest rate based on the previous period interest rate, plus some feedback coefficient on the difference between the actual price and the desired price. Um, now you can adjust this because if there's trends in the pricing, you would adjust the target over time. So there will be, it can include a trend in the price level target. But what this says is this rule has a strong historical dependence. If a shock comes that raises the inflation rate, this central bank will actually bring the price level back to where it was. Rather than letting bygones be bygones, it will contract policy to bring the price level back down. So if you think of it in the world of supply shocks, the central bank would not only eliminate the inflation shock, but would also tighten monetary policy even further than you have from the negative supply shock to get the price level back to the original trajectory. So this central bank hit it with the supply shocks. This is gonna be a much more contractionary policy unless you can somehow adjust the, the way in which you implement the target. 
Another approach um, which has got widespread uh, support is nominal income or nominal GDP targeting. Um, and the idea here is to target nominal, avoid nominal recessions at all costs. This is particularly important in a world now where we have very high amounts of government debt and private leverage is very high. So the main thing is not to get inflation down, it's to keep nominal GDP growth high and rising. And, um, and so a norm, normal GDP growth target will actually balance the reaction to inflation and output from a supply shock. So if our inflation rises by X percent and output falls by 10 X percent, nominal income is roughly unchanged, so you wouldn't change the policy. So this is a, you could also write this as a nominal growth target. It has similar implications to the price level uh, versus inflation target, which I won't go into. Um, another uh, approach is what's called Henderson McKibben Taylor type rules. Um, Henderson and McKibben, i.e., my co author and I, published this in the same Carnegie Rochester conference as John Taylor, and we're working on the same project. Um, this, is a, this is a way in which we write down the Henderson McKibben Taylor rules. You have the interest rate being set based on a weighted average of a whole range of indicators uh, inflation relative to target, output relative to target, nominal income relative to target exchange rate relative to target or the money stock relative to target. So this general form of a Taylor rule with different parameters, if you have alpha, beta, gamma and sigma equal to zero, you can actually replicate an, a, a fixed exchange rate central bank. And so this allows you to pick various combinations of feedback coefficients to mimic the trade-offs that actual central banks um, have in different countries. Now, Let's get back to target monetary rules. So we've got the targeting rules are an interest rate feeding back on some uh, variables. Um, and as I mentioned, monetary rules tend, all the monetary rules tend to handle demand shocks very well. Managing supply shocks though is much more complicated. And climate change will imply a world of greater supply shocks and demand shocks, but supply shocks will tend to dominate. I want to stress that this is really important for the output gap because inflation forecasts are a function of the output gap. And the Taylor type rules have an output gap in the rule. So if you cannot estimate or if the estimation of output gaps breaks down, this is a problem for inflation targeting, for flexible inflation targeting, for price level targeting. It's less of a problem for nominal income targeting because, for example, if you have a rule, if you've got the output gap wrong by 1%, so output, suppose output growth is 1% lower than you had originally projected, then inflation will be 1% higher if you achieve your target. So you're bounded in your inflationary range. Your inflationary expectations are tied down. They're just not tied down precisely to a, to a fixed number. Given that output gap estimation is likely to be harder under climate change, this suggests if you're thinking of a climate world, you'd start to think about nominal income targeting of some form rather than inflation targeting. So one of the key issues for inflation, well, all efficient climate regimes price, price carbon, as I showed you, they have a rising carbon price because you're trying to drive emissions lower over time. If you do it too quickly, the economic loss will be substantial. It's also more, um, it's also consistent with a hoteling type rule. So any of these regimes in the climate space will lead to changing the underlying inflation rate. You'll get a different trend in inflation. And carbon price volatility is different. Under a cap and trade, you'll get more carbon price volatility around a trend than under a carbon tax or a hybrid regime. So monetary authorities are going to face more frequent larger and negative supply shocks. Think of what they would do under the different monetary regimes. An inflation targeting central bank gets a negative supply shock, inflation rises, output falls. Uh, the central bank would then tighten monetary policy to cope with the higher inflation and that will cause uh, a problem for the real economy. Secondly, um, real-time measurement of the output gap is going to be extremely difficult in this world. And so and we know from the evidence from the Fed that the output gap um, forecasting, the, the errors in output gaps are getting larger over time. Price level targeting would be an even bigger problem in this world because you would raise interest rates not only to bring inflation back, but you would actually try and return to the original price level even if you adjusted it by the, uh, the carbon price. So both all of the various conventional monetary rules of flexible inflation targeting, fixed, um, fixed inflation targeting or price level targeting, a central bank could easily worsen the impact of the supply shock on economic activity. The HMQ rules balance output and inflation trade-offs and the normal income rule also does that. So 
does seem that if you're worried about climate change, probably a normal income targeting rule or various forms of HMT rules would do a better job than an inflation, uh, strict inflation rule. And a critical issue for central banks is how well do you anchor inflationary expectations? Which of the targets is actually more reliably forecastable? And that's an, a critical issue as well. So now let's put the two together uh, and say, well, okay, we want to work out what's the best joint regime? What's the best climate policy when you take into account what the central bank's trying to do? What's the best monetary policy when you take into account what the climate um, framework is? So again, let's look at a carbon tax. Uh, again, I'll use the GQ model, but a carbon tax is a complex aggregate supply shock because it's not just aggregate supply, it's relative supply with across sectors. So you get relative price movements. Um, you're increasing the, the cost of fossil fuel inputs, so raising the price of energy, reducing output. Um, you can use the revenue cleverly if you have a pro-growth recycling, but the net effect is likely to be negative. It seems from the models it's reasonably small, but it's still likely to be negative. Um, now I'll do, just do an example where we have a 3% inflation target um, and we're trying to achieve this each year. What does it look like? Well, I've already given you an example from the full model, but let me simplify it. Suppose we have a carbon tax at period T. We were surprised and it's just a one-time increase. It's not a trend increase. It's just a step up in, 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 in the carbon tax. Inflation will go up and output will go down. So this is the case of price level. The price level will go up and then it will stay back at trend. Inflation jumps and then it goes back to where it was. So this is quite straightforward for central banks to handle a simple carbon tax. Um, but it does depend on the rule. Um, it, a strict inflation targeting central bank will raise interest rates that will slow growth, appreciate the exchange rate, which will hurt exports, and reduce inflation but um, worsen the economic decline. A flexible inflation target can easily adjust for this. It's, uh, it'll moderate, a central bank will moderate the interest rate increase, but you have to be able to de detect what is the carbon tax signal in the, in the data versus the noise, the normal noise in the system. And the price level target will have to have deflation relative to trend to get price level back to where it was. So here's a case where instead of the carbon tax jumping and staying there, suppose the carbon tax rises at 4% real each year. So the carbon price, the price level rises, but there's a new trend in the price level. So this makes it harder for central banks. So an inflation targeting central bank or a price level targeting central bank is going to have to make a decision. Will it change its inflation target? or will it bring it back to its original inflation target? So um, the carbon tax is actually much easier for central banks to, to deal with than other types of climate policy. Emission trading gives you uncertain price signals because we don't know what the cost of abatement is uh, a priori. Um, hybrid policies work quite well because they're better than the emissions trading system because the short term price is, 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 looks like a carbon tax. And it's almost impossible for a central bank to work out the carbon signal through a rep from a regulatory system. I've gone back too far. Okay, so with the HMT um, and the and the normal income targeting rule, we, we get a more balanced reaction to output and inflation um, shocks coming from carbon policy. Um, the HM2, HM2, HMT rule. Uh, it involves a difficulty because we do use potential output forecasting and we use the output gap. Whereas the normal income rule um, is basically you don't need to know the output gap or a forecast of the output gap to do a projection of a normal income growth. Uh, and so you can actually trade off the um, missing the output growth target with higher inflation or vice versa. So we really the question then is which is better ankle, uh, anchored? So we did some initial work um, a few years ago for the Reserve Bank Conference on 25 years of inflation targeting, just to ask the question, well, what, what can you forecast better? Can you forecast inflation? Can you forecast real output? Or can you forecast normal GDP? And this, is, of course, is just for Australia, but these are the Treasury forecasts, um, or OECD forecasts. And uh, this is uh, um, forecast errors. So you can see that normal GDP is the blue line, real GDP is the red line, and inflation is the green line. You can see as we get closer to the present, the forecasting errors for inflation are getting bigger. And if you normalize these by the size of the variable you're forecasting, so inflation, if you normalize it by the fact that inflation is 2%, whereas nominal GDP is closer to 
you normalize it, then the forecast errors now for inflation are uh, proportionately bigger than they are for nominal GDP. Now, a lot of work needs to be done for different countries, but the argument that you can't use a nominal income rule because you can't forecast nominal income, I think breaks down in the Australian case. Now, let me just finish up with a few more simulations from GQ. So, this is from the, the, the Oxford paper. Um, we just take the GQ model and we say, okay, how do, how do three different central banks respond to an impact to a carbon tax? This is the carbon tax we're going to feed into the model. We jump to $25 per, per tonne, uh, and then we have it rising at, a, at roughly 4% a year. So this is what you'd expect a carbon tax would look, look like. What happens to gross output relative to what it would have been under the different a, a regimes? So we've got a pure inflation targeting, which is the light blue. So the pure inflation targeting central banks ignores the output effect, sees that inflation rises, will tighten policy to hit the inflation target and therefore cause the economic contraction to be a lot worse. Flexible inflation targeting can offset that to some extent, but the nominal GDP target has the smallest economic loss in, measured in terms of gross output. If you look at inflation, no inflation under the exact inflation targeting rule. Um, some inflation when there's a trade-off that the central bank has adjusted and uh, knowing the, the model and knowing where the shock is, and then um, nominal GDP targeting allows for more inflation, uh, CPI inflation, but not more producer price inflation. What happens to CO2 emissions? Well, it turns out you get a lot more reduction um, from doing a carbon tax with a central bank that's a pure inflation targeter because they hammer the economy. And the, economy, the CO2 emissions fall because of the carbon price, and they fall even more because of the very contractionary monetary policy. So it does matter what the central bank does in response to the climate policy. So in conclusion, um, expect more larger supply shocks as well as demand shocks, but I think supply shocks will dominate. Uh, climate policy design that has predictable transparent price signals is good for central bankers. So a carbon tax or a hybrid makes monetary policy more transparent. Um, nominal income targeting appears, at least in our modeling, to be better than inflation targeting because it avoids the need for the forecast of potential output. It doesn't require to understand the precise nature of the climate related shock and it still anchors inflationary expectations to within a band. And so I think it ticks all the boxes that central banks worry about in terms of credibility, forecastability, et cetera. But in the end, this is an empirical question and a lot more empirical work is needed um, before we have a conclusive answer. And it will be different across economies because the structure of economies is very different. Fossil fuel based economies look very different to non-fossil fuel based economies. A lot more detail about my, the model or the analysis at my website, sensiblepolicy.com. I will stop there. Thank you very, very much. You went through your slides very quickly, and of course, it makes it hard for us to, to, to digest everything. Nevertheless, uh, it was really fascinating. Uh, you put forward a lot of issues. And of course, uh, most of them, and, and coming to the to the final part of your presentation, very, very uh, important uh, and relevant for, for us in this discussion. Um, we've got only one question so far. Uh, could you please uh, read? Because yeah. I, 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 um, the, the, the question is with uh, the effect of the carbon tax on different energy types and uh, the, the, the effect as you have showed us in the slide the effect was higher for gas than for oil and the question is isn't the carbon content in oil higher than in gas so it should be the other way around yeah. yeah so that's that's a great observation whoever made that observation um, what you see in the data, so we're basing our data, uh, our modeling on the GTAP database, the global trade um, database out of Purdue University. And the way we measure the emission coefficients is not a physical measure, it's the value of output, is the amount of emissions per dollar of output. As it turns out in that database, there is actually higher emissions in uh, gas than there is in oil. Uh, and this is a problem that a lot of the CGE models that use that database have to grapple with. So it's not physical units, it's value units. Um, and that's the reason for that change. Coal is unambiguously the most carbon intensive and it shows up in that database as being so. But this is an issue that's, uh, that's in the data um, when you do it the way that it's done. 
Yeah, I would like to ask a question with respect to the uh, installation reaction to the different climate policies and, and also the monetary policy reaction to that inflation increases. Because you, in, at the very beginning of your presentation, you told us that uh, introducing a carbon tax could uh, the policymakers then could decide to use the revenues from the carbon tax for different uh, proposals, like the example, for example, reducing the capital taxes or also uh, giving back some of the tax revenues in a lump sum way. And I would assume that uh, these different policy proposals also have different impacts on inflation. So if, if, if for example, the government uh, hands back the revenue in a lump sum way to the uh, citizens, then there should be some positive demand shock stemming from the introduction of the carbon tax. And that also then uh, should have some uh, a different impact on inflation. Did you also model these differences and their impact on inflation? Yeah, yes, we did. I mean, the central banks are responding differently. The, the Fed is responding differently to each one of those recycling assumptions. Because if you, you're correct, exactly right, if you give it back to households and they spend it, then you're going to get a higher inflation from the demand side on top of the inflation from the supply side. So the Fed will have to tighten policy a little bit more in that case, which is why the lump sum tax has a bigger output. Um, a, a lump sum rebate has a bigger negative effect than the car, than the recycling as a capital tax because consumers are increasing their uh, demand, and that's causing the central bank to tighten policy more than otherwise. Uh, because the rule is a, they're trading off inflation and output, but there's higher inflation under that policy than under the capital investment policy. Yeah, I would have a, an, another question uh, on your first part of your presentation, uh, where you explained um, the properties of all the policies, uh, of all the options of policies we would have for climate policy. And uh, you only went through uh, typical command and control uh, policies very quickly. Uh, and, and, and said that from an economist point of view, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it has a lot of disadvantages, it's uh, unpredictable at all. Uh, and the problem is that uh, in reality, of course, uh, command and control plays an important role. I, I would suppose an even bigger role than pricing of, uh, of carbon so far, at least. Yeah? So we have. Um, I mean, you could assume that subsidies are also part of the pricing uh, strategy of carbon, but if you take all the standard and all the other measures, uh, direct, for example, we have a, a direct target, for example, for the automobile industry yeah, and things like this in, in Europe. There's a lot of uh, command and control policies at the national and the European level. Yeah? Um, but the question is, um, are, I mean, is, it, is, there, is, there, is there for you a way to live with these policies? I mean, of course we have to live, but is it, for example, then are there ways to deal with it if, 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 if these policies are, are the major part of, of climate policy? And um, I think in reality, in, also in the future, we have some combination of all type of policies. So we have to live with, with, with all that. And then the, way, the question is whether there are ways to, to, to um, better uh, um, live with or to better react on, on this type of policies. And in particular, in our context, also very interesting how to react on green finance policies. Are they, do you think they have a specific, uh, um, a specific feature that, that might, be, uh, might, might cause uh, uh, pitfalls for, for central banks and their policies? You know, greening, greening the financial system, we have a lot of proposals now uh, like um, uh, disclosure for companies and banks, uh, like uh, rules for, um, or even even you could have discount factors for for uh, uh, reserve policy rules and so on, things like this. You're exactly right. The reality is that carbon pricing 
is likely to be the less uh, implemented policy. The reason I raised that was because from a central bank's point of view, um, if, you, if you can identify the price signal and you're an inflation, flexible inflation targeting central bank, yes. you can extract that price signal and you can adjust your inflation target m more easily. If you don't know that, if it's all regulation and inflation, it's very complex, you, you can't unravel the price signal. So then the question is, does that mean therefore that normal income targeting, which doesn't require the extraction of that signal, is that a better strategy for a central bank who cannot understand what the what the carbon price signal looks like? Because you're trying to, in a real economy, you've got noise, you've got the carbon policies, they're all interacting, it's very hard to extract a, a proper price signal. And so it's just a pure question of, does this tip the balance one way or another? Perhaps it doesn't, uh, it depends on how big the price signal is. I mean, if it's tiny, um, but if you looked at the, um, some of the energy price shocks that we've seen in the data so far, and some of the price changes based on climate policy interventions, it can be quite significant. So it's really a question of how does it change the decisions of a central bank, how much the climate policy can be extracted. Yes, okay, thank you very much. We have another four questions now. Yeah. I'll check. Uh, so the, the next question would be, uh, you talked about the increased volatility and uh, so the question is, should the central bank address this increased volatility and uh, because also the increased volatility of prices and of, of carbon prices especially would also affect GDP. So how would the central bank ideally react to that? Yeah, so another good question. So yeah, the higher volatility is a pure economic cost. So you really from the point of view of climate change, there's no benefit with having a volatile price. It just creates more volatility, less GDP. So it makes it harder for the central bank. They'd probably, they have more price volatility, probably low, lower inflation perhaps if GDP um, is weaker. But the point is, if you can avoid the volatility, it's unnecessary, which is what is the case for a carbon trading system. You don't have to go to carbon trading system. So you can eliminate it in the design, and that's good for the central bank. Central bank. Um, that's the point I'm making there. Um, for the for the Henderson for the um, for the for the um, hybrid policy, I mean it eliminates the volatility in the short run, and the long run volatility is really price discovery, and it's 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 pricing all the information in the long run. So again, if you had the choice purely from a central bank's point of view and the economic loss from volatility you probably would rule out permit trading. However, that's what European trading system is. Um, so you know, that choice has been made, but it can be changed. Okay, uh, the next question, because you, you mentioned this, uh, you presented this hybrid model, and uh, they also mentioned, I think, that Germany would be interested, but are there any countries you know of that have already introduced such a hybrid model of taxation? Well, again, um, I get asked this question all the time, and, and I have been um, invited to Japan. I've been to very many countries, Korea, Japan, when they were implementing their carbon pricing strategy. And the question was always, well, if it's such a good idea, why don't you do it in Australia? And it was almost implemented in Australia in 2007 under the John Howard government. He lost the election, uh, and so the opposition had to come up with a different policy. So. Um, at the moment, climate policy in Australia is toxic, as you're probably aware, uh, because the policy they put in place for the carbon tax and it collapsed because it was a very badly designed market mechanism. Um, so, yeah, no, as anyone else doesn't know, um, when New Zealand introduced inflation targeting in 1991, had any country ever done it? No. Um, was it a good idea? It turns out it was at the time. So I think the idea here is not to not to be backward looking or being, it's good to be an early early starter and to try these policy frameworks before there's a crisis when you have to change your monetary framework or your carbon pricing framework. Um, it just minimizes cost. So yes, but no one's done this exactly, um, but I think that that doesn't mean it's not worth, uh, and when I say Germany, I mean German academics have been talking about it, not necessarily the German policymakers. Um, the next question is with respect to the carbon border adjustment and here uh, people would like to know in your simulations uh, when the carbon border adjustment is introduced, is it introduced only by one country or is it introduced at a global level or can you, can you discriminate between these two cases in your model so that you, because it, it is possible to assume that it's 
it will be introduced only in a group of countries at one time. So that I guess is a good question. So border tax adjustments or border and carbon adjustments are very, very difficult to implement. So the beauty of a model, so there's two two aspects. One is if you're importing fossil fuels, if you're importing oil, coal or gas, you would normally, if you have a carbon tax, you would normally do a border tax adjustment on the primary energy. What we were analysing in the model wasn't just that. It was because we knew, we had the model, we knew what the fossil fuel content of every single good from every single country actually was, which means we could therefore levy a tax based on the carbon content of that good, which meant that we could do a border tax adjustment across the entire spectrum of imports. Now, it turns out in practice, we don't have that. In practice, we don't know whether an electron electricity uh, came from a, uh, a, a nuclear power station or from a wind farm or from a fossil fuel generator. So if, in practice, if you're going to implement that, you'd have to do, um, you'd have to actually use some sort of average or some other very arbitrary measure. So I think border carbon adjustments are a very bad idea. And when you model them in the model, most of it comes from the border tax adjustments just to fossil fuels. So all of that was really related to fossil fuels. All the rest was tiny and complex. And so we've written several other papers um, in 2006 which said border tax adjustments are not a very good idea because they're very complex, they're very expensive to administer and actually don't make any difference to global emissions in the modelling. Okay, but you know that the European Commission has now already proposed that they want to introduce something like that for the EU as well. Well, um, I, I do know that, and it'd be very interesting to see the size of the, the a document that describes how you implement such a policy, because it's very complicated. It's perfectly normal to do it on fossil fuels, or on, on you know you could do it on cement and aluminium and paper, things that you know pretty well what the carbon content looks like and is important. But you know, to do it on automobiles, components have to be analyzed. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's complexity beyond belief. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a bad idea, but um, someone needs to do experiments to demonstrate that. Let's see. So there's one more question, um, and that is with respect to the long-term effect of, uh, in the, that you have showed. Um, because what, what we've seen, uh, the uh, GDP effects of the introduction of any kind of carbon policy or climate policy would be negative. It's and the question here is, uh, will these, uh, if, if, if these effects are also negative in the long run, uh, it will be much difficult or much more difficult to sell carbon policy or climate policies to the general public. And actually, we would expect in the very long run that actually, uh, due to the uh, mitigation of physical risks, the GDP effects or the effect on living standards by these carbon policies should be positive at some point in the very long time future. So uh, can you somehow compare these scenarios? So um, the, the chapter for the World Economic Outlook coming out of the IMF uh, later in the year actually addresses this exact question. We use this model and we look at the impact of a, the benefit of avoided damages. Uh, we look at a whole range of issues to do with green infrastructure investment, how you can do a stimulus package and actually change relative prices of fossil fuels, not using carbon taxes, but using um, infrastructure programs, looking at subsidies for renewables, you can actually get net positive benefits over time. So in these examples I've given you, um, there's no benefit feedback from, the, from changing the emissions today on the outcomes today, because the benefits come from lower temperatures in the future. The lags are enormous. So even in the IMF work, you get the losses up front for a decade or so, but you can generate net benefits by 2050. So the horizon we're looking at is, is 2050. Um, so that, yeah, that's a good question. You can do this. We can do it in our model. It's, the world is much more complicated, but it doesn't, you can't front load it sufficiently to avoid the short term upfront costs of changing the energy system in the way in which we have the world configured. And that relates to adjustment costs of capital, a lot of fixed capital in place. The losses are actually the, the destruction of physical capital. Um, you can get a lot more benefits from building uh, e energy efficient um, generation and using technologies in emerging countries and new capital 
it's much cheaper than actually restructuring existing capital in advanced economies. So, you know, it's a good question. Yes, if you've got enough time, it will be a benefit. But right up front, with the horizon we're looking at is 20 years, 10 to 20 years. Um, these are the, I was focusing on the, the issues for monetary policy, which is what would happen today. And it's almost certainly there'd be a slowdown in the economy before they get the long-term benefit. I have one more question. There's, okay. there's one more question now, and that uh, refers to the uh, presentation of nominal income targeting. Because uh, it seems to work very fine for uh, the adjustment to climate policies, but uh, so the question is, if for example you have a declining potential output, then probably nominal income targeting would lead to some overreactions, and you would then have a period of uh, higher inflation for a longer time. And then, do you see any ways around this problem? So that, again, that's a good observation. So. Um, that is a, it is a problem, but I don't think it's a very big problem. Suppose your nominal income target is 6%. And the way we create this is suppose that your, you think potential growth is 3% and inflation target is 3%. So you have a nominal growth target of 6%. Now suppose that your, your, your potential output drops from 3 to 2. How much extra inflation do you get if you achieve your nominal income target? Your inflation goes from 3 to 4. Going from 3 to 4 is not the end of of the world as we know it. Um, the output loss, losing 1% of output, if you get that from an inflation target, is much worse uh, than, than, than a 1% higher inflation. So I think, again, it is an issue, but I think it's an, it, all we've done is taken a precise target for inflation and created a band. And the band target is between the upper and lower estimates of potential output. So you're still, I think, satisfying the requirements for a nominal anchor, but there is a degree of flexibility in there. I mean, if you think about the global financial crisis, one of the beauties of a nominal income target in a GFC world is if, if the world, if output collapses to minus 3%, and you know that you have a nominal income target, let's say of 6%, then you know the central banks will allow a 9% inflation, which means the real interest rate can drop dramatically more than it did in the actual world of 2009 when, the, when inflation was, was anchored at, at 2 to 3% in many countries. You couldn't get a real interest rate response from the central bank because you had inflation expectations were too well tied down. So that's another advantage of a nominal income target is that when there's an emergency, it enables you to unhinge inflationary expectations but still have them tied down. And that's a real problem with inflation targeting. And it's also a problem with inflation targeting in a in a COVID-19 world. Actually, um, we want people to think inflation is going to be higher so real interest rates can fall even more to stimulate the economy. If you believe that the central bank will always get the inflation target, it makes that channel inoperable, and so you only can use fiscal policy. Um, so, yeah, much earlier than we expected, we we can now close our meeting, and uh, we can leave you to your uh, dinner. For us, uh, we, we we hardly have time to, to eat our breakfast, so you start with the dinner already. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, for presenting a fascinating uh, topic, and I think it's now uh, made uh, the whole the whole range of issues we've, we've dis discussed so far uh, more complete. And we'll continue at uh, 11 at our time uh, with Irene Monesarolo. Uh, for the time being, thank you very much, and uh, see you later. So I think we still, uh, yeah. No, I think we <laughs> could already start. You think that? Since um, now everybody should have had enough of a break to to prepare for the for the next session. Now, after the first session, which was dealing with monetary policy, we now switch again to um, financial stability issues, financial market issues, um, which, uh, as I already told at the very beginning of, of the whole summer school, it's a bit at the, it's a bit more developed in the in the recent wave of uh, of. Uh, central bank interest in uh, climate change issues. So the monetary policy debate has only just started, while the financial stability debate has already 
started a um, couple of years ago, and Irene Monsarolo was right at the beginning, I think, at the one uh, one researcher at the front of on, on this on these issues. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the uh, climate economics and finance uh, uh, area of the uh, uh, Institute for Ecological Economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. At the same time, she is also uh, a visiting research fellow at Boston University. Uh, we have collaborated with Irene already quite for a while. Um, I think it was already two years ago that we uh, we started by having a, a research um, program on on uh, financial market risks within the portfolio, non-monetary portfolio, Monetary policy portfolio of the research in uh, It was quite a pioneering um, um, effort you, you did there together with uh, Stefano Dantisco. Uh, um, and now we, and you also worked together with the, with the NGF list and with, with another, uh, with a couple of other uh, central banks. Um, and you, uh, lead also very important uh, research projects. Um, so actually, yeah, that's I think all the rest you can read in in, in the in the bio list that I've sent to you. Quite an impressive uh, CV so far. Uh, Irene, without further ado, I, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much for being with us, and we are very curious to hear what you have to tell to tell us. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Andreas, for the very kind uh, introduction. And yes, it has been a pleasure to collaborate with the uh, OMB uh, in the last uh, in the last years. Um, it has, in particular, even more recently, we have just uh, closed with uh, uh, Wolfgang Poitner and some colleagues uh, a new analysis of so the um, um, classification of the Austrian Credit Registry into climate policy relevant sectors in order to. Uh, understand to what extent our Austrian banks as post climate transition risk. So there is a lot of research going on and also Wolfgang was very kind to come with us at the COP25. So yeah, mm, there is a lot going on. So today, let me share my screen. Okay. Today we present the results of the research. This has been developed by me and a group of colleagues. It's an interdisciplinary team from different universities. You have already um, talked about Stefano Battiston from the University of Zurich and the University of Venice recently, and then also, uh, uh, but also a uh, um, broad um, group of researchers at, uh, at VU. Uh, and at the University of Genoa with women collaborating. And today I will start from uh, some recent results that we have been developing in the last three years on climate stress testing, uh, right on uh, assessing climate risk on financial stability, and in particular in the context of uh, a disorderly transition to a low carbon economy. And you might have uh, heard this term already in the last uh, two days of lectures. With disorderly transition, we consider uh, a late and, and sudden introduction of policies or regulations to achieve the climate targets that cannot be fully anticipated by investors in terms of their impact on the economy and finance. And I will start in particular from uh, results of the climate stress test um, and move to um, one step back uh, how, to what extent these results could inform the development of macroeconomic models that can be used to uh, assess climate-related financial impacts in the economy and then feedback to the, uh, climate, to the traditional climate stress test. In particular, I will present the insights from the um, top flow consistent agent-based model that I've developed with a team of researchers, in particular Marco Raberto from the University of Genoa in 2018, and this has been further developed in the last two years. 
and that we are uh, currently in uh, applying to the with the European Central Bank for its crime testing. So just briefly starting with an overview of what we are going to discuss today. Um, we, are, uh, we will talk about the relation between climate change, economic competitiveness, and financial stability. On this topic, for who is interested in, we have a spe I'm quoting a special issue on Journal of Financial Stability with Stefano Battistone and Giannis Fermos that is forthcoming in the early autumn. In particular, we discuss uh, climate as a new type of risk for the financial sector and for the economy, uh, discussing its characteristics of deep uncertainty, nonlinearity, and endogeneity. And then we will look at uh, how financial institutions uh, are exposed, to what extent are financial institutions exposed to climate risk, um, building on the research of the climate stress test, but also from recent policy applications. And of course, uh, why this matters for central banks and financial regulators, so why central banks uh, started to engage in the debate. Then I would like to um, make, uh, analyze a more recent topic of, uh, uh, for um, macroeconomic and financial discussion, which is the uh, role of the COVID crisis. And in particular, I would like to bring some results from a, a research project I've been developing for the World Bank on the macroeconomic and the financial uh, risk assessment of compounding COVID and climate risk. So what happens when a risk compounds? And what we saw is that actually uh, under specific conditions, the risk could be amplified and we don't have a recovery of the economy even five years later. So we, uh, we see um, an example of hysteresis. Uh, then we will focus on the um, couple of applications of the area in stop program consistent agent-based models, uh, agent-based model. Uh, in particular, we will discuss uh, uh, the pros and cons of different macroeconomic uh, models that have been used to, uh, in the context of climate economics and finance, and in particular the importance of assessing, uh, of analyzing uh, how risk generates in an agent's balance sheet, its transmission channels to the agents and sector of the economy and finance, and the drivers of reinforcing feedbacks that could give rise to amplification effects. Here you can recognize several uh, people in this picture. Uh, central banks and financial supervisors started to worry uh, about the impact of climate change on the economic and financial stability since the uh, historical speech by former governor of Bank of England, Mark Carney, about the tragedy of the horizons. Climate change came in the radar of uh, central banks. Uh, now more than 50 central banks and financial regulators and supervisors have joined the Network for Green the Financial System, which is aimed to provide metrics and methods to support investors to disclose and assess climate risk in their portfolios. Um, of course, the aim is to, for central banks to be able to deliver on their mandate, which is preserving financial stability. More recently, um, also the IMF, at the last World Bank IMF uh, annual meeting in October, um, considered climate change as a priority, and in particular, the new um, uh, leader of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, said that uh, the IMF will start to do climate stress testing. Other central banks in Europe have even start, uh, have also started to consider new dimensions of uh, environmental and sustainability risk, and in particular, ESG risk in their balance sheets. And this is, for instance, Banca d'Italia. Why they worry? Well, because climate change represents a new type of risk for financial actors, for four, in particular, um, for four reasons. First is deep uncertainty. Uh, we know that the forecast about climate change and its impact uh, contain uh, large uncertainties uh, due to the presence of uh, tail events and tipping points that, if crossed, could trigger domino effects that will not allow us to come back to um, pre-shock uh, conditions. Um, in particular, this, uh, the target has been set to uh, two degrees, uh, increased temperature above pre-industrial levels. 
Then it's uh, climate change is characterized by nonlinearity. Indeed, the recent research uh, by Ackerman showed that the distribution of extreme climate-related events, for instance, the heat waves that uh, occurred in Europe in the last 20 years, are highly nonlinear. And this is important because it makes historical data a poor proxy of future events and that of future risk. But what happens in finance is that usually we use um, past data uh, as a reference to estimate uh, portfolio exposure to future risk in case of events. Then climate change, uh, the nature of climate change risk is forward looking, which means these are events, both if we consider climate physical or climate transition risk, and we will discuss later um, their characteristics, these are events that we have not experienced yet in the past. And uh, most of them, uh, in particular, when we talk about physical risk, the worst impacts are expected to occur in the mid to long term, which means uh, mm, from the mid of the century. While in contrast, uh, the modus operandi of the financial sector is backward looking. And also, it's based on short time uh, horizon. So just to quote Stiglitz, now the uh, investor's decision is the nanoseconds, but even if we don't uh, go so far, we all know that investors have a um, uh, monthly time horizon, while central banks have a three to five year time horizon in their uh, decisions, policy decisions. But the most important, uh, I think that the main characteristics of climate change that is relevant for finance, as far as we knew from, uh, we saw from the modest results, is endogeneity. Indeed, we know that in order for uh, a successful low carbon transition to occur, we need both governments and investors to play a role. However, the decisions of governments to introduce the climate policies influence the decision of investors uh, to um, decarbonize the portfolio and scale up low carbon investments. Uh, if these uh, um, investment decisions and policy decisions uh, actually are not coordinated, what happens is that we don't uh, achieve the climate and energy targets and thus the Paris Agreement targets. The sense to which governments decide to introduce climate policies and investors to um, um, reallocate the portfolio depends on their risk perception of climate change affecting their business. Through which channels could climate change affect uh, um, the economic competitiveness and financial stability? Well, there are two main channels that were discussed first by Carney and then in a uh, working paper by Bank of England. Let's talk about the water. The first is climate physical risk, which is the impact of more extreme and weather events on economic activities, for instance, hitting uh, um, uh, firms via capital stock destruction. We will see later how this then will uh, cascade in the in the economy uh, and then affecting uh, uh, investment decision, uh, that employment, uh, household consumption, uh, GDP, and eventually sovereign bonds um, stability. Uh, of course, this um, affects also uh, financial actors. In, for instance, banks. If firms uh, are not able to repay in to repay the loans, banks could occur on performing loans and then have shocks in their balance sheet. Um, the second channel is climate transition risk, which um, consists in an uh, introductory change in uh, um, climate policy or, reg or regulation to achieve the climate targets, for instance, consider the um, carbon tax or carbon leakage uh, regulation, or technological shocks, for instance, a sudden change in the relative price of um, energy technologies, fossil fuels, or renewable energy. And depending on the extent to which investors uh, are exposed to high carbon or low carbon assets, they could have, uh, they could experience um, asset price revaluation. And if large uh, asset classes are involved and systemic financial actors are involved, this could have an impact on um, price stability 
and thus potentially affect um, financial stability. These two channels have been analyzed uh, in the literature in the last uh, uh, five to ten years, but mostly have been treated separately so far, and both could lead through different channels to the realization of carbon stranded assets in the economy. Um, in our analysis with the uh, financial network modeling of climate stress, mostly we focus on uh, transitional risk because they could uh, happen sooner and be more financially relevant than physical risk. However, the relevance of these two types of risk depends also on the country and region of analysis. In several low-income countries, where uh, the uh, level of development and deepening of financial markets is mm, very limited, but uh, for instance, consider our Caribbean countries, most of the economic activities are really close to the sea and thus exposed to sea level rise and regular climate hazards like hurricanes, climate physical risk could uh, eat much earlier. When we talk about uh, um, climate risk, uh, we know, uh, and I think you heard from uh, K1's presentation uh, two days ago, the relation between um, fossil fuel comb combustion emissions and climate change. And we know that for a low carbon uh, transition to occur, the share of fossil fuels uh, in the economy should shrink. But as you see here, and these are the um, main OECD countries, uh, where the first air, um, bar for each country is the share of fossil fuels on, G on gross value added of the country before the Paris Agreement and after the Paris Agreement, there has been, a, uh, for most countries, a decrease uh, in the, a decarbonization of the economy after the Paris Agreement, but still, for some countries like Norway, the share is very significant, so like 17%. Uh, for Mexico as well, and Canada as well. For other countries, like, such as Australia, the share of fossil fuel activities on GVA even increased after the Paris Agreement. On, uh, what happens to finance? That investors are highly exposed to economic activities that directly or indirectly depend on fossil fuels for their business and revenues. These are the activities that we call the climate policy relevant sectors, which allow, which are the, these five activities, which have been further refined, refined recently, for which we considered not only the contribution of economic activities at NACE four digit level, so the most disaggregated level you can find, um, on emissions, but also the role of the activity um, in the business value chain, because for instance, fossil fuel, fossil fuel extraction per se represents only 3% of uh, emissions in the European Union. But of course, without fossil fuels extraction, we don't have all the burning of fossil fuels and emissions along the value chain of the business sectors. Uh, and, uh, and then we also consider the sensitivity of the sector to a change in climate policy, for instance, the carbon, um, via increased costs due to carbon leakage uh, um, introduction or um, change. As you can see from this uh, analysis that we did in the uh, climate stress test published on Nature Climate Change in 2017, um, financial actors, and in this case we have larger investment funds, are largely but heterogeneously exposed to climate policy relevant sectors. Uh, sorry, Rick, uh, a, a question which you think is essential to understand uh, your presentation, and that is, what exactly does it mean, the share of fossil fuel in gross value added? So, okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a, a metric, sorry, um, this is an indicator provided by um, the OECD. Uh, provided by OECD data. Actually, it's uh, um, computed as uh, the contribution of uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction and combustion um, to the activity. So um, it's based on the uh, energy technology of the activities of an economy. What is the share of fossil fuels on uh, uh, the fossil fuels used uh, on, in the activities? of an economy. 
the, the, um, we can go shortly then uh, on this. So the European Central Bank has also started to assess climate exposure of investors to climate transition risk, finding that this is relevant in particular um, for uh, investment funds. And more recently, we discussed before about the recent application also to the Austrian credit registry of the methodology we developed three years ago. Why it is important uh, uh, to assess investors' exposure uh, to climate uh, policy relevant sectors and thus to climate transition risk, because large exposures could trigger systemic risk in a disorderly low carbon transition. Here in the climate stress test, we compute the uh, value at risk, which is uh, one of the most used financial risk matrix by investors and uh, financial supervisors uh, for the 20 largest banks in the um, European Union. Uh, however, caveat, we consider only their equity holdings portfolio because we did not have access at uh, uh, credit registry uh, for uh, exposures at disaggregate level, so NACE two digit or NACE four digit. And what we can see here is that the value at risk changes considerably uh, according to, um, to the scenario. So in a bank that has uh, already engaged in decarbonizing its portfolio, so is a, a relevant exposure to low carbon sectors, or the bank that is um, still on the business as usual, so uh, most of the portfolio is exposed to uh, high carbon activities or carbon intensive activities. And uh, the second element is whether the bank, uh, we are considering direct or indirect exposure, so what we call in stress testing a second round. Indeed, for instance, the first bank is Deutsche Bank. This, uh, the um, largest uh, losses uh, for Deutsche Bank will come from its direct exposure, for instance, direct uh, own ownership of uh, equity holdings of uh, Exxon, for instance. But for instance, for Credit Agricole, the largest losses will come from indirect exposure. So for instance, the uh, exposure that Credit Agricole has on uh, Deutsche Bank, which is in turn exposed to Exxon. And what we can see here in the two charts, and in particular the second chart below, is that um, under, uh, when we consider indirect exposure, which means when we consider the network of interconnections um, and interdependencies across banks, for instance, the interbanking market, the losses in the context of uh, a brown uh, uh, bank um, portfolio allocation are amplified in comparison to when we consider only direct losses. This is why it is important to consider not only direct effects and direct exposures, but also indirect exposure. So in stress testing, what we call second, third, or fourth rounds. However, we also saw that uh, markets are still uh, not uh, fully pricing this risk. This is an um, analysis that recently published with uh, a colleague from the University of Bologna, Luca De Angelis. And uh, uh, we have um, developed our five factors from a French model to uh, test whether um, there is a, a significant difference in the risk return profile of low carbon indices. Here we define low carbon indices with indices based on renewable energy and technologies and uh, high carbon indices, which is indices based on fossil fuels and uh, um, carbon based technologies after the announcement of the Paris Agreement. So we did an event study. And what we found is that actually, um, while the systematic risk, so beta plus gamma, decreased uh, considerably after the Paris Agreement for uh, low carbon indices, meaning that they are more appealing for investors, we have very mild and not significant reactions for um, high carbon indices. This leads us to consider how material is the risk of stranded assets in the economy and finance. This depends of, um, from how the low carbon uh, transition is implemented. Indeed, we could have two, uh, opposite, um, two op options. One is implemented the transition in an orderly way, which means the governments introduce credible and stable climate policies, and thus in, like carbon tax, and thus investors 
can anticipate the policy and price it in their investment. And this will lead to a smooth price adjustment via market signaling. However, in contrast, and this is most likely the scenario we are uh, looking so far, we are experiencing right now actually, there could be a delayed introduction of the climate policies that are needed to um, deliver, for instance, on the EU 2030 or the Green Deal target, and thus investors are not fully able to anticipate the policy impact on the economy and finance, and this could give rise to asset price volatility. In this context, there are uh, two um, potential uh, two elements that could um, help to mitigate uh, the shock. On the one end, of course, is the stable introduction of climate policy, but also on the other end is what should we do with uh, fossil fuel companies. And one, uh, there were some recent analyses that looked at how to use uh, carbon tax reinvestment to support the reconversion of these companies or uh, to bail out such firms. Um, but in reality, however, what's happening in the fossil fuel sector is that several companies actually are either buying renewable energy plants like ENI in Italy, or they are buying insurance to edge against the risk, their risk of stranded assets, for instance, Exxon. How uh, the risk could cascade in the economy? What are the channels to the real economy and finance? You represent uh, uh, the result of um, a recent article we just uh, which is forthcoming the Journal of Financial Stability with Nepomuk Dulce and Aljad Nakvi. You see, the policy that we consider is the introduction of a carbon tax, an unanticipated introduction of a carbon tax. We see an effect on the, um, the transfer of the uh, cost of the tax to households via markup on pricing, and this in turn affects the demand, where brown, uh, B stands for sorry, brown uh, firm and G for uh, green firm. The carbon tax introduces a relative uh, price effect in favor of uh, green capital goods, thus lowering their demand. And however, both channels, which means the uh, increase in cost and prices of uh, brown capital goods uh, and decrease in uh, relative um, prices of um, green capital goods, both affect the uh, profitability of uh, the um, carbon intensive of brown firms, lowering their ability to service the loans. In this case, we consider non-performing loans for banks. And through this way, the risk is transferred to the banks, which will have to consider it in the context of the capital negotiation and uh, compliance with the regulation, such as Basel III, and thus could react by changing their um, interest rate, the recharge for the, for the loans to brown or green firms. More recently, we have analyzed the case of what happens when risk compounds. So, and the most relevant example right now could be the uh, COVID crisis. And uh, um, so far, the COVID crisis has been treated as a public health issue with short-term economic and fin financial repercussions. However, this way of looking at the crisis prevents to look at how the pandemic risk interacts with climate change and, as a consequence, financial risk. And thus, this could lead to underestimate the policy response that could be uh, for the recovery, for the crisis recovery. In particular, what we saw is that neglecting a compounding risk could underestimate losses. And thus, it is important when designing policies that, uh, to, um, for the pandemic recovery to consider also the context in which the pandemic has emerged. and how these three types of risk interact. Here you can see a picture of relations that connect the, um, that shows the channels of uh, transmission and relation between uh, pandemics and health and public policy, pandemics and climate change risk, pandemics and financial risk, and financial risk and economic risk. The uh, pandemic, the relation between uh, COVID and health and public policy 
has been actually uh, at the core of the discussion, so I will not focus on this. It has been less uh, analyzed um, the relation between uh, COVID uh, and climate change risk. Indeed, on the one hand, the increasing frequency of uh, climate-related uh, disasters and hazards could damage socioeconomic infrastructures, such as hospitals, that are critical to contain the epidemic spread. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, the processes in the, in the economy that uh, actually um, cause emissions, uh, for instance, uh, PM10, could also uh, weaken our immunitary system and thus um, create a fertile ground for exposure to epidemics. The channel of risk on which we have been focusing in our analysis has been uh, finance and economics and the relation with the pandemics. Indeed, we look at our shocks on private finance, for instance, uh, uh, lower revenues, uh, lower tax revenues, uh, could affect the uh, GDP performance and then the government budget. And on the other hand, this could affect the ability of the country to build resilience to future risk, for instance, to invest by investing in infrastructures, in healthcare infrastructures, but also to be able to refinance itself on the international market via the change in the risk associated um, to the sovereign bonds. And here you see uh, a picture that um, shows uh, the um, risk transmission uh, and the direct, potential direct and indirect impact of two types of risk. So if we consider uh, COVID and the three entry channels in the economy via lockdown and social distancing, via tourism, shock on tourism, via travel restriction, and shocks on remittances. This is particularly important for emerging and low income countries. And um, in contrast, in the case of a natural disaster risk, we have that the direct impact on the, so the way in which the shocks enter the economy uh, is via the um, capital stock destruction. So you have a flood that destroys some um, productive capacities of firms that are affected by the, which are in an area affected by the flood, and this prevents them to uh, actually um, uh, continue their business in the short term. This, of course, has implications on the production of the firm and also on their investment and firm's profitability. And from investment, you have uh, then uh, firm profitability, you have then um, channels of cascading risk to dividends and as households wealth. So who owns the equity uh, shares or bonds, um, relative prices and as household demand, but also employment decision of the company and as again, also demand, uh, and the contribution of the um, firm and sector to uh, GDP and thus to the government's fiscal revenues. And this will affect then the um, ability of the country of refinance itself. Also, it will affect the ability of the firm to repay loans and thus affect uh, um, the balance sheet stability of the banks and potentially lead to a revision of the credit conditions. In that, uh, while the uh, impact on capital stock destruction can be considered direct impact, we have also two indirect impacts, which are on the financial sector and on government debt sustainability. Thanks. 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 I'll use uh, this uh, transition to the next topic for a, for a short break of five minutes so that people could uh, uh, grab a coffee or, 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 or smoke a cigarette or something. Yeah? Okay. 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 So let's resume in uh, about, yeah, at, let's say, quarter to 12, yeah, if it's fine, yeah? So in about nine minutes exactly, yeah? Okay. But by the way, I mean, just um, let me thank you that you put in the, the COVID issue. Um, 
I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I really fully understand how everything connects to each other, uh, but the main message is, of course, that it's very complex and, uh, and it complicates issues possibly for, for climate policy as well. On the other hand, of course, uh, it is uh, also an opportunity in the sense that we now may learn from the COVID crisis and, uh, and use this, this, this knowledge also for dealing with the climate crisis in a sense. Yeah? But, yeah, well, this is, I think, relevant because uh, um, so far the discussion on, the co on how to respond to the COVID crisis has been, uh, okay, should we use the, the money for climate change, mitigation and adaptation, or should we use the money to um, finance the COVID recovery? Uh, in an article that we published on the uh, Financial Times and the Euroactive with uh, a colleague, actually we discussed why there is no trade-off and there should be no trade-off. And indeed, in the application that I'm showing uh, in the second um, uh, half of the lecture, I will show uh, with the application of the macroeconomic model uh, why there should not be a trade-off and uh, how we contributed to inform the policies of, of the World Bank uh, in this regard on, uh, and to, uh, with the aim to build back better, which means align the COVID recovery to the climate targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are already again in the middle of the debate, and I think we could continue after some few breaks. Let's start in a couple of seconds. Yeah, I think now everybody is in. Okay, Irina, the floor is yours. Okay, so um, uh, brief, uh, we focus here on the model development and application to the context of climate policy and to the new context of the um, COVID and climate, inter climate risk interaction. State of the art, so there were several macro uh, macroeconomic models developed that uh, applied to assess the impact of climate change on uh, GDP, um, for, uh, were mostly macroeconometric models, uh, integrated assessment models, which are a particular type of models, which are, uh, could, be, could belong to two main categories. Uh, one aggregated model, such as the Nordau style or uh, uh, Thole and Hope style models, which have a long-term economic growth model with aggregate technology, mitigation cost curves of climate change, and damage cost curves. They are mostly applied to cost-benefit analysis. Decide what's the optimal level of uh, carbon tax uh, given a certain uh, damage that we want to have. Um, then the other, the new generation of integrated assessment models is what K1 explained, explained a couple of days ago. So our process-based uh, uh, models, which uh, have disaggregated the fossil fuel and renewable energy technology and work on cost minimization. Then uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, impacts of climate change and uh, climate policies have been also recently analyzed in uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, so DSG. Here are only a couple of examples, so nobody feel excluded. I mean, there are more, there is growing stream of research on all these fields. However, what we also learned from the last financial crisis is that there is some troubles with, uh, with, uh, with macroeconomic models. These troubles were uh, clearly explained both by Oliver Blanchard, the former head of uh, econ head economist at the IMF, and also by Joe Stiglitz in a special issue on uh, Oxford Review of Economic Policy, um, published 2018. And the main challenges of the models are with the macro foundations, uh, the um, lack of modeling of the financial sector and how it actually works, uh, and the reliance on representative agent models, um, which actually prevents to understand uh, uh, distributional issues, and that's, for instance, the drivers of inequality. In the context of uh, uh, climate economics and finance, there are some other issues that we should also, uh, that are hardly addressed in, in uh, traditional macroeconomic models. 
The first is that the climate shocks are mostly treated as exogenous. They are, they are, uh, they are averaged, uh, which means that you cannot really uh, consider the heterogeneity of exposure to risk, uh, which matters a lot, both across countries and regions. There are no uh, feedbacks from uh, either the climate change to the economy or the economy to climate change. And it's very difficult to look at uh, um, the potential path dependency so, uh, of a policy in, the, in particular um, on the uh, different agency sectors of the economy. Then other um, issues that have been debated a lot are, of course, the choice of the damage function, either concave or convex, because it has an, an effect uh, on how you calculate the impact and the need for policy response. As well, and this is also the main issue for the discounting. I mean, applying it has been highly debated also by Stern. Uh, this topic has been highly debated also by Stern, in particular in the Stern report. Uh, having a high discounting means that we actually postpone or um, edge our current risk at the cost of future generations. And this, is, uh, and this leads to develop um, optimal climate policies uh, that are actually too low to uh, address uh, the uh, risk in the system. Then there are however, other issues, and I group them in two groups. In particular, we have um, such models rely on market clearing prices. They have uh, agents and sectors have unconstrained access to liquidity, uh, whether there is or there is not a bank in the, in the model. And there is a, a perfect suitability of production factors. What does it mean? It means that the agents and the system react immediately to the shock and um, allows uh, the structure, allows the reallocation, immediate reallocation that contributes to bring back the model to equilibrium. Other two issues that are relevant and been uh, only recently started to be analyzed uh, in relation to traditional macroeconomic models are the lack of finance which usually is either missing or is very still stylized, which is, um, works only as a conduit of savings for investments, or, and inequality, which is either missing or, as in uh, some recent uh, DSG models, is built by construction. And this actually doesn't allow to assess the main drivers of uh, risk generation and uh, transmission in our system. To address some of these issues, there were, uh, was a recent stream of uh, macroeconomic modeling, uh, which um, is based on stock flow consistent and uh, agent based models and network models in particular. Here I mentioned only a few examples. It's really an expanding field. Um, we uh, dedicated a special issue in ecological economics on reviewing them. So if you're interested in this is the reference. However, uh, these models have contributed to uh, analyze the impact of uh, green fiscal and monetary policies and uh, green financial regulations on the um, agents and sectors involved in the low carbon transition and also apply to unilateral climate policy introduction in north-south models. Uh, recently, network financial network models have been uh, applied to uh, look at the macro financial impacts of uh, climate risk and these are the climate stress test that we have already discussed. I provided here, um, and I'm not going to go through it uh, uh, now, but for maybe it could be of interest for you, a table where uh, I compare different uh, uh, macroeconomic modeling approaches um, according to different dimensions. So yeah, I'm considering uh, comfortable general equilibrium, uh, DSG models, input output, uh, stock flow consistent, and agent based models. And um, you can see main differences uh, starting from the production function. Uh, where we have mostly um, Cobb Douglas or um, um, these uh, functions for CG and DSG, and mostly LTF for input output models and stock flow consistent models, while we could have both uh, for agent based models. The main difference, I think, uh, comes from when it comes to how uh, the relation between savings and investments. Indeed, the most stock flow consistent agent based models are demand driven models. And the role of interest rates, 
where you have all, usually an optimal uh, and inter interest rate. You have usually two interest rates for optimal intertemporal consumption balancing in the first two types of approach, while in contrast, you have uh, several types of interest rates in the stock flow consistency and the gen-based models um, set by the central banks as policy rate and by commercial, commercial banks based on the sector and the firm a specific risk consideration. And this interest rate, importantly, uh, affect the investment decisions of the, um, of the agents. So they directly enter in the net present value calculation, for instance, in the model that I'm going to present. Uh, the first uh, three type of models uh, are equilibrium models, where while uh, instead the stock flow consistent models work on accounting principles, and agent-based models are were known for being out of equilibrium models. Prices uh, in uh, CG and DSG are uh, market clearing, sometimes with frictions. There is no price change in input output tables, while in uh, stock flow consistent and agent based models, there are no market clearing. Also, importantly, um, while in stock flow consistent models, we have limited heterogeneity in agents in order to keep complexity in the, uh, at a level which is manageable to have a, a balance sheet consistency. And we will explain in a few minutes what does it mean. Uh, in uh, um, agent-based models, we have a, a wide heterogeneity across agents. Uh, expectations, uh, while in the first group of models, they are mostly rational or they are, there is no expectation in input output tables, they are mostly adaptive in uh, stock flow consistent and uh, um, agent-based models. Markets are mostly centralized in the first group of models and decentralized in the second group of models. Why this matters? Because indeed, in the real economy, climate shocks are endogenously generated by our production and consumption behaviors and can have long-term impact on the, on the economy and on the stability of the financial sector. Then, our reactions, uh, either we are producers or consumers or policymakers, are characterized by a time delay, and this affects investment decisions and expectations. In, all, in, in addition, since we are subject to imperfect information, uh, we might, we as agents, maybe uh, our reactions may depart from full optimization and rationality. Another important point to consider as a potential driver of risk amplification as shown in, by recent research, in particular in the aftermath of the last financial crisis, is the interconnectedness of economic and financial actors that can amplify shocks. In this context, when uh, we consider um, sources of risk such as climate change that are characterized by high uncertainty, as a first step, the, uh, since no model can do everything <laughs> and answer to all policy questions, we might uh, need to simulate potential scenarios, so uh, identify some scenarios that could be relevant and, uh, for our country or context and simulate them, and then uh, do punctual forecasting. And in simulation, the simulation is the strength of uh, stock flow consistent and agent-based models. Uh, they are able to represent agents as a network of interconnected balance sheets, and this allows to increase the transparency with regards to the drivers of the shock transmission and the impact for a better policy evaluation. They depart from equilibrium conditions and strong assumptions on rationality and uh, perfect markets. Importantly, they provide a rigorous accounting framework where equilibrium conditions are substituted by accounting identities that hold irrespective of any behavioral assumption. In the context of uh, agent-based modeling, they allow to study for the emergent aggregate statistical regularities in the economy, which cannot be originated by the behavior of a representative or average individual. And this allows us to study the micro-foundations of macroeconomic modeling. A main feature of stock flow consistent models is the sectoral balance sheet matrix, which is a matrix uh, which describes all assets and liabilities for these sectors, 
uh, which means it uh, represents uh, a snapshot of the economy at a certain time. So on each column, we have the balance sheet of an agent or a sector that always sums to zero by the definition, while on the rows, we have the assets or claims across sectors that generally adds up to zero. Assets are usually reported with no signs, while liabilities are reported with a negative sign. And here you have an example of the balance sheet matrix of the Erin economy, uh, uh, where we remember yeah, we have on the uh, column the balance sheet of each agents and sectors. And here instead, indeed, we have uh, the worker, workers' households, capitalist households, um, <coughs> capital, uh, capital goods production, uh, or um, energy uh, sector, bank, the central bank, the government, and the rest of the world. And instead, in the rows, as we say here, we have the um, assets and all the claims of assets across sectors. Here I listed only a few ones. So we have tangible capital, inventories, gold in the vault, government bonds, banks' loans, central banks' loans, bank deposits, central banks' reserves, and equity. And indeed, here you can see that um, uh, also the use of the sign. And it sums up to zero in our case. There are other two characteristics, which are the cash flow matrix, which report the changes between two points in time, uh, and the mm, network change matrix. But this, I mean, I will skip here for sake of time, but I leave it in the, in the presentation with an example based on our, on our model. Model description. With the model, with the ARIN model, which is a stock flow consistent agent-based model, we have used it to address four main research questions, which are how could green fiscal, monetary policies, and financial instruments, such as green bonds, foster the low carbon transition, and under which condition could the policy complementarity uh, be exploited to achieve the low carbon transition. Also, under which conditions unintended effects on financial stability and inequality could emerge? What role do investors' expectations towards climate policy and the transition play in, uh, in achieving it, so in, in the success of climate policy implementation? And what happens when risk compound, and in particular, what role governments and monetary policies could play in the recovery? Well, if you are interested in the applications, we have a new website here of the project, Greenfin, that is funded by the Austrian um, Climate Research Program, where we actually included all our research results. Uh, the main characteristics of the model, we have heterogeneous uh, agents and sectors of the economy. So we have uh, uh, capitalists and workers' households based on uh, local lock terra predator prey model. They are heterogeneous um, in, in terms of uh, income source, wealth source, and access to finance, as well as uh, saving and consumption behavior. We follow the Deaton buffer stock theory of saving. We have heterogeneous capital goods which are characterized by low carbon or high carbon energy technology and a specific natural uh, resources or so material and uh, um, emissions intensity, which are represented by parameters. We have a Leontier production function with capital, labor, uh, energy, and raw materials. We have heterogeneous energy product producer. So uh, we have low carbon and high carbon utility and uh, um, coal, oil, and uh, gas um, fossil fuel producer. And we have behavioral rules, which are based on experimental and evolutionary economics. This is a snapshot of the model framework, which represents what I just uh, explained, but also includes the main uh, capital and uh, current account flows. So the solid lines are the main uh, current account flows, and the dotted lines, the main capital account flows. Could not represent all of them here, for, <laughs> uh, because otherwise it would have been not possible to read the um, uh, figure anymore. But uh, they are all explained in the um, documentation of the, of the models. <clears throat> 
for, um, you can see that we have a non-financial uh, sector, which is composed by the energy market agents uh, and a, consu a consumption good producer, which could decide uh, to use either uh, green or, um, or brown capital goods. And the capital good, uh, capital good producers which could uh, use energy, either uh, brown or green. Uh, we have uh, uh, two types of households, so workers, which get their main income from uh, um, wages, and capitalists that uh, get main income from profits, but also to access to financial markets and thus to dividends, which are paid by the government on the issuance of uh, sovereign bonds, which could be either brown or green if they are aimed to support low carbon investment projects and by the commercial banks. Uh, we have a central bank which is in charge of setting the monetary policy rate and could engage in unconventional monetary policy operations, so asset purchase such as the quantitative easing. Also, we have a fully fledged financial market which is characterized by uh, both uh, uh, equity holdings of stocks uh, and bonds, and which could be both green or brown depending on the uh, firms that issues them. And we are a foreign sector that uh, actually is connected to the real economy and mostly uh, via um, <clears throat> um, raw material and energy export and import, but also via services, for instance, tourism demand. We have some main behavioral equations, so the monetary policy decision uh, where a central bank sets the interest rate according to a Taylor Reich rule, and the interest rate depends on the inflation and output gap, which is measured as an employment gap. So employment gap, so the distance to a target level of uh, unemployment. We took, for instance, in the first application of the model, the reference, uh, the average in the European Union. The government can issue uh, sovereign bonds. Uh, we, we have regular bonds to cover its regular expenses, such as the salaries of public workers. Um, but, uh, but also, the government could uh, issue uh, green bonds, which are conditioned to support uh, um, low carbon investments, uh, for instance, in the energy and the electricity sector. Um, as of, uh, households, uh, consumption plans are based on the buffer stock theory of savings, meaning, uh, and this um, allows to balance the impatience of households to consume all income and wealth with the prudence about the future. So when considering, uh, for instance, economic conditions and uh, employment conditions, which uh, prevent, this prevents them to drown down their assets too far. The firm production function uh, uh, is based on uh, um, Leontief production technology, which means that we don't have uh, sustainability among, among production factors in the short term uh, time horizon of the model. We usually use the model to simulate in the five years. And the main characteristics of the model, I think, uh, is the net present value. Um, here I present the main blocks, so uh, we have uh, <coughs> the uh, block for uh, production of capital goods on the labor market, uh, natural resources, so the uh, natural resource intensity and price of resources, which is related to a new unit of production, so delta Q, and uh, the energy price uh, of the, uh, that supports the production of a new type of unit. While in down we have uh, the um, uh, interest rate, which is uh, um, actually where RD is the um, interest rate for the loans or for financing of the of the firm, while uh, um, PJ uh, is the uh, expected inflation uh, on the consumer goods, on raw materials, and on energy prices. Why is this important? to have an endogenous net present value with uh, four uh, cash flows. So one is a positive cash flow uh, given by the additional sales due to the investment. And then we have three negative cash flows, which are due to the additional labor cost required to match the need for increased production capacity. 
the additional raw materials required and the additional energy required for an additional production unit. Because this formulation allow us to understand agents' intertemporal behavior by comparing the short-term oil investment with their long-term benefits. And the sign of the net present value allows to determine whether the agents make the investment decision. And this is determined endogenously. We have a credit, on the credit supply still, uh, we have a capital uh, bank as a maximum credit supply, which is set by its equity level, divided by the capital adequacy ratio parameter to comply with the Basel III regulation. And finally, we have some fundamental asset pricing model for equity and bonds. I will skip it here. So let's have a look at the first scenario, uh, the first application with uh, when we compare the uh, impact of uh, um, carbon tax, which is the blue scenario, the green sovereign bonds, which is the red scenario, and policy coordination of uh, green bonds and carbon tax, uh, which would allow the government to support the uh, production of uh, uh, renewable energy technologies. And we compare them uh, in comparison with a business as usual of no policy. This is what we obtain on the uh, on GDP and deployment. So we see that scenarios characterized by the introduction of a carbon tax and green bonds actually experience higher GDP rate growth as a result of growing investments in the green economy. The scenario characterized by green bonds is the best case for uh, actually um, uh, both real GDP growth, which drives actually down unemployment. In contrast, with the introduction of climate policies, uh, usually a, a business usual scenario of no change in uh, investment is the worst case. In all scenarios characterized by the introduction of the policy or the climate aligned policies, despite different extent, uh, the uh, production of renewable energy on total energy increases. But also we can see different distributive effects uh, between uh, capitalists and workers' households. And these distributive effects are more accentuated in the case of the carbon tax. Why? Because this affects directly household demand as we saw at the beginning in the um, transmission channel features. In contrast, uh, we have the uh, least distributive effect in the case of green sovereign bonds, but this comes, of course, at the cost of uh, um, public depreciation. However, what I would like to highlight is that, uh, yes, there is new public debt creation in the case of green sovereign bonds, but this is public debt that actually lead to a potential green multiplier and allow the green economy to increase and develop. Here we have a comparison of the uh, two uh, type of policies, so the carbon tax and the green bonds. Uh, with respect to uh, main uh, macroeconomic variables and other variables. We have uh, real GDP, which are the balls, uh, unemployment, which are the squares, uh, debt to GDP ratio, the Ips, and the real wages, the empty balls. Then we have also emissions, wage share, and uh, price levels. What you can see actually is that uh, I mean the main difference as you can see is in the terms of um, in terms of uh, real GDP growth and unemployment. Indeed the carbon tax in place a uh, trade-off. We have a decrease in emissions because we have a decrease in uh, uh, carbon intensive investment and thus actually a shock on, uh, on the production and as unemployment, and this instead uh, transfer, is transferred on employment and wages. While in the context of the green bonds, we have an increase in investment and in green investment, which drives up GDP and thus employment. And uh, this also affects the yields on the bonds that are held by the capitalist households and by the bank. However, as we discussed before, it is not uh, budget neutral. 
and you can see it to the debt to GDP ratio. Yeah, we still like to compare what happens when uh, we have uh, a policy mix uh, on the mean wage share and the real wage share. Here we can compare different degrees of uh, climate policy financing with uh, either when it's um, zero, it means that we have uh, um, zero green bond financing and 100 we have uh, full, um, tax, uh, full policy financed by the carbon tax. And we can see, for instance, that uh, the wage share increases with a high carbon tax, uh, tax share. Uh, and this is due to lower brown firms' profits and stock prices that reduce uh, capitalist income. I would like to start now to uh, have some re recent results of the application of the compound COVID and climate change uh, macroeconomic and financial risk assessment, where we use the same model, but we tailor it to emerging and low-income countries. And in particular, we focused on uh, the role of tourism, remittances, export of raw materials, and uh, domestic lockdown on uh, consumption and production. Uh, we, uh, in particular, focus on the case study of Jamaica because this was uh, highly impacted not so much by COVID, so a few cases reported or at least uh, tested, uh, but high external shock via prices of its main export good, which is aluminium, high shock on remittances flows, and high shock on the uh, tourism sector, which is expected to drop by 67% uh, in 2020. Plus, we had uh, already early government intervention, already in April, uh, equal to 1.1% of GDP, and central bank intervention to uh, control exchange rate. In this case, first, we did a climate disaster risk assessment uh, and the first issue here is the availability of uh, past disaster risk, which we need to uh, actually uh, build a damage function, uh, with which then we uh, assess the impact of uh, potential future disasters on uh, capital stock in different sectors of the economy, basically agriculture, industry, and sector and tourism. In particular, in the case of uh, Jamaica, uh, we had to rely on uh, two offic uh, official data sources of disaster risk. One is MDAT and the other is this inventor, which has been developed by UN, uh, um, a new UN agency, UNISDR, covering 30 years. In particular, we cover hurricanes because these are the most, uh, one of the, this is one of the most important uh, recurrent hazards in Jamaica. And the damage function that we calibrate, and you can see here, translates uh, sustained wind speed into the potential damage for the economy. Then we translate this damage on the um, return period uh, for uh, 5, 10, 30, 50, or 100 years uh, on the uh, shock on the sector of, of the economy. And we consider as mild a return period of 10 years and uh, tight a return period of 100 years. However, even in the context of 100 years, uh, which is the strong scenario, uh, you, the shock is rather limited. It's 4.2% on service sector, which includes tourism, which is the main driver of GDP in, in, uh, in Jamaica, but it's much more limited on the industry and on agriculture. And this is due, however, to the availability of data. We then define four scenarios. Uh, two scenarios are characterized uh, only by a strong hazard, so natural disaster, um, which uh, impact in the economy on the uh, third quarter of 2020. This is usually the season of uh, hurricanes in Jamaica. Then we have a, a scenario characterized by only COVID shock, um, 
which we uh, estimate to hit in the second quarter, 2020, so when we started to have uh, cases reported. And then we designed two scenarios which are characterized by compounding COVID and um, other risk and uh, disaster risk. Um, and plus, we consider the, in these two scenarios also the policy interventions introduced so far, so on the fiscal side, the fiscal measures, and the monetary measures. We simplify the structure of the, um, of the economy. And in this case, we don't consider the uh, financial market. And here we get to some results. What we can see on the real GDP is that there are actually uh, long lasting negative effects, in particular when risk compounds. Indeed, this is the main difference between the two scenarios. So in the case of natural disaster, we have a shock when the disaster hits. But then we have a recovery uh, when firms start to invest again to build back uh, the destroyed uh, capital stock. In contrast, in the case of compounding risk, and in particular when we have uh, late and strong uh, hazards, we see that the, um, actually the shock, uh, the sojourner shock on tourism triggers supply and demand dynamics that contributes to reverberate the shock in the economy. I would like to highlight that here we used optimistic assumptions of a full recovery of tourism flows and export flows uh, from next year because there were no better estimates provided by official data. The shock on GDP, of course, is also uh, an impact on uh, the labor market. And here we can see the um, unemployment rate, which is, a, again, a, a, a fast increase after the disaster, but then a, um, a recovery as soon as the production restarts. Uh, in contrast, in the case of the COVID, uh, but in particular the compound risk scenarios, we see actually a persistent effect. And this is due to actually uh, the um, expectations of the market, uh, of the market uh, which affect uh, on the new potential lockdowns and the strong effect uh, on the economy, which occurred in the, um, in the two semesters where tourism tour flows were blocked and export uh, fell and also remittances fell. That affects, uh, that on the one end, leads some companies out of the market, and on the other end, um, increases uh, actually um, uh, um, cost for households and leads some of them uh, under poverty line, which means that they have uh, actually impact on internal consumption uh, and demand, and thus on investment uh, decision of the firms. Here, uh, I just leave a few slides. So we have uh, uh, differentiated impacts on uh, um, uh, workers' households. Uh, and then finally, also on uh, the export rate, in particular of aluminum, because it's the main export product of the, of the country. And on tourism. I would, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I would leave this slide up to you and uh, just comment uh, shortly the uh, re results. Um, and here maybe it's the last slide that we could comment. Here we simulate different level of uh, spending. So what would have happened if uh, instead of spending 0.5% of GDP in intervention, the government would have increased the spending to 3% of GDP. And overall, we see a positive uh, impact of higher spending on, uh, on the recovery, mostly in all scenarios, but in particular in the compounding uh, scenarios, at least in the short term, when then, however, the uh, external uh, market demand, market conditions would affect again the economy. I will stop here and I will have the time for a few questions. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Really fascinating. Uh, we've got one uh, question here that uh, relates to um, your latest, the last part, and this is uh, whether why TDD increases in both shocks, after both shocks in the simulation uh, with the carbon dex and with green bonds. Um, yeah. This is due to the share, increasing the share of uh, green energy investment. So you have not plotted them here, but this is the main driver of uh, the, incre uh, the increase. And this is due to the fact that uh, the, um, the, um, the subsidies, the green subsidy, uh, either uh, directly via the green bonds issuance or indirectly via the carbon tax, uh, directly enters in the NPV calculation of investors that uh, I showed uh, that I showed before. Okay. So actually, the increase in GD, this also means that uh, given a certain level of carbon tax, and here we consider the level uh, recommended by the Stiglitz Turn report, which is much higher than, uh, but not extremely higher uh, than uh, Nordhaus models. Actually, this could have a signal on the green market. And this also means that uh, the foreign investment uh, for high carbon companies is more than compensated by a uh, new green investment. So the price is around 50 to 90 or so? Uh, we use here, uh, yeah, we use here an average of 60%, 60 dollars per ton. Um, one question I would have is, uh, you mentioned very shortly the green multiplier. And then at the very end, you should have a multiplier. Is this green multiplier already included in that, or is it? Uh, uh, and could you could you uh, disentangle it from from the rest of the multiplier, so to say, or is it just a theoretical concept? No, it's not a theoretical concept. We uh, analyzed a bit more in detail in the last application in the uh, in the context of the uh, COVID uh, recovery year when we simulated different degrees of uh, GDP, um, of public GDP spending, which is year financed, of course, via uh, via bonds. Um, this is what. Um, this is the concept that emerges from the from the results, um, but of course uh, uh, we are testing it uh, uh, more solidly. But it pro already provides some interesting uh, uh, points of discussion, uh, at least based on the stimulus on the green, uh, green uh, investment share, meaning on the increase in the green investment share. Then, of course, this has to be, to be considered uh, in the broad context of, uh, in the broad macroeconomic and financial context of the country, and in particular on the stock and drivers of public debt in the country. So, whether this new debt uh, could be fully sustainable and how to make it fully sustainable. And I see here another question. It says uh, the effect of green bonds only on emission reduction appears to be almost negligible, or yeah. in a misinterpreted chart. Uh, on the overall, only on emission reduction is uh, limited, but it's not. Wait, not only negligible. Let me see. Sorry, just. Uh, 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 um. Well, it's not really negligible. Uh, actually, it's even uh, it's even higher uh, than uh, in the in the context of the carbon tax because actually uh, you have a higher share of the uh, green economy. Okay, um, I would have one more question. Maybe you can just clarify it because you, uh, as far as I understand, the carbon tax is also meant to change the relative price between different uh, capital goods. And you told us you're using a Leon tier production pump where you have a very limited uh, subsidiability. So this means in the short run, the firms cannot substitute their capital goods. So, so sorry, I don't hear well. Could, could you repeat? Sorry, the, uh, I, I lost you at the Leon tier. Yeah, so you're using a Leontic production function where you have basically no substitutability between production factors. 
Uh, well, we have a limit on sustainability. Yeah. But, but can the, the firm, if the rest price is capital to pay, can the firm then substitute away from the now more expensive fossil fuels, for example? Yes, because uh, in the production function, maybe we, cons we consider um, you know, capital labor uh, and uh, all the uh, raw materials and uh, which are based on different uh, uh, emission technologies. And in this context, yes, the firm can substitute, of course, to a certain extent. And this potentially limits the uh, impact of the policy on the on the transition, I mean, that we see in, uh, at the firm level. But it, it also avoids to have some uh, kind of uh, uh, difficult to explain uh, jumps because the investments at the, at the same time are based not only on uh, the subsidy, but also on firm's consideration of uh, uh, which are ba uh, based on its cost of production uh, which are affected by the subsidies, but also by the cost of credit and by the cost of labor and the price of energy and price of natural resources. However, yes, the uh, effects that you would see here are more limited at the firm side than if we use the Coptagra function. Um, thank you again. Uh, I mean, I realize that you you, you stopped before uh, uh, showing us in your latest, your, your last slides. But if you want, you could finish uh, the, the, the last slides and, and you could extend for it for another 10 minutes or so if you, I mean, you don't have to to end sharply at 10.30. So if you still want to continue to tell us the, the, the key messages of, 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 or to repeat it, then don't. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, mostly they refer to the last presentation uh, on, uh, on Jamaica. So what actually uh, we um, identified here is that in the context of the country, the COVID negatively impacts the Jamaican economy via shock on tourism and to a lower extent on remittances and prices of exports. However, these exogenous shocks eat the capital stocks and the, uh, and the production of services, in particular in the service sector, triggering self-reforcing supply and su demand dynamics, which in turn affect firms' investment decision, employment, consumption, and then, of course, GDP and the balance of payment and debt to GDP of the country. What we also see is that there is, uh, when, why we usually consider natural disasters as uh, uh, particularly um, difficult to manage by a country for, and for the economy, we see that in the context of compounding risk, the, f the negative effect could be even larger, and in particular, they could be prolonged and could affect uh, investors' uh, expectations and thus the recovery. We also see that the go uh, timely government intervention in terms of fiscal and monetary policy is important from the central bank in that case, is important and that uh, um, um, could act, but however, it's not only the magnitude of the intervention, what will have to be analyzed further, and this is what we are doing now, is actually the understanding of the quality of the intervention, which means how to uh, align the recovery um, to the climate mitigation and adaptation objectives of the countries, which are stated in the national determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. And in this context, uh, given the magnitude of the challenge and the fact that uh, mm, the business as usual so far has been addressing one problem separately at a time, so a sectoral approach policy, and did not really work well when we have interconnected challenges like the COVID, climate change, and macroeconomic and financial stability. So uh, an opportunity for research and policy would be to exploit, explore sorry, the role of policy complementarity, and in particular um, across three dimensions, to assure coherence of policies with the broader goals of sustainable and inclusive development and uh, conditionality of the policy, 
which means, uh, for, in, for instance, in the context of central banks and regulators, condition new asset purchase or refinancing operations or new credit lines to the decarbonization of the business of the companies. I think these are really perfect final words uh, for for this part of uh, of today of today's session. Um, I I think I, I just want to add one 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 idea that is I think some somewhat uh, uh, here at least for for almost everybody, but that uh, stock consistent models lie, of course, very much. Uh, in the core of uh, ecological economics. And because as soon as you start to think of limits in terms of uh, resources or things, then you have to think of stocks and not flows alone. Of course, for, for many of us, we, we, we don't even think one, one minute about stocks generally. Uh, but um, but in, in the new context, of course, this is a very important concept. And I think we can, we as macroeconomics, we can quite learn a lot from, from, from you in this, in this sense. Thank you very much again. Thank you so yeah. much, and I really appreciate these last comments. Indeed, uh, I mean, it's uh, not a new lesson. It's already a lesson that comes from the system dynamics model of the limits to growth to understand in the context of the low carbon transition, what is a stock, what is a flow, and what influences them. And this, light of the art of the fact that, uh, uh, first of all, no policy is a uh, uh, win-win for everybody. There, is, there are uh, winners and losers in the, uh, for every decision. And what economists could do and central banks could do is to show uh, what are the pros and cons and for whom of different policy applications. But then, of course, it's in the hands of the policymakers to take the decisions. But this uh, I mean, and the analysis of the pros and cons of different policies, in particular in the context of uh, complex systems, when we have different sources of risk that interact, is really uh, uh, could be really supported by an analysis of the fundamentals of the balance sheets of the of the agents of the of the economy and how they are connected, because this shows us that actually time delays matters. So it, it takes time to accumulate a stock. So uh, if you have usually in the lessons, I make the example of the bus tube, but it takes time for a bus tube to fill, but also to, uh, uh, to lose uh, water. And this is what we should consider when uh, we support, I think, policymakers in, the, in how to achieve the climate and energy targets. I mean, time left is very short, and the policy instruments sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, as we see also with the quantitative easing, might not uh, uh, be as powerful anymore uh, after so long use. So probably we have really to um, get back to the roots of our, uh, our system and understand how it works. And that's why simulation sometimes is very supportive to forecasting. Thank you also for this uh, very uh, convincing appeal to us, and we will indeed consider it. Thank you very much, and see you for the rest of you. See you, see you tomorrow morning with our last session. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.